It's like that short, fat guy I saw one time over in Coney Island. One of the... Oh, well, I've only been to Coney Island two times. And it's significant to report that each of the two times brought another, a new, a cleaner milestone into my life. If you, if you look around, you can see these milestones everywhere. Now, now, they're not really milestones. They're just small toothpicks sticking out at random from the vast canopy of existence. <laughs> uh, just a little caviar there and a little of the fried bacon. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, of course, it takes many forms. Like this friend of mine was driving along Broadway on a beautiful summer Sunday afternoon. He's driving along there, and there's, a, there's an air of, of, as though, in a sense, things have been deserted on Broadway on a summer Sunday afternoon when he looked out of his car window and he saw a small monkey, a small monkey pounding on the door of a bar that was closed. This was upper Broadway up around the 80s and 90s. So, and, and this monkey is pounding away at the door. The monkey knew exactly what he was after. And he's pounding at this door. And my friend just continued to drive on, his face averted, because he wished to retain the sight of a solitary, small, underage monkey on a Sunday afternoon pounding on the door of a closed bar on Upper Broadway. This has meaning, I guess. It's, it's, uh, it's like, you know, there, there, there is a trick to it. Not really a trick. Some people do, some people don't. Some people have the ability to walk through life, to, to, to kind of absorb it and reflect it and feel it churning inside of them, walk through life, with the feeling that they have just been given the car for the first time by their old man. It's a summer afternoon. They have just learned to drive, and they are venturing out on their own, the first solo flight. All of their life, they can keep this beautiful, beautiful, clear mirror before them. And then there's the rest of the people, the great horde of the disenchanted. Of course, if you're going to face it, there are those two types, the enchanted and the disenchanted. And the enchanted are the ones who, of course, are slowly but surely being ground under heel, who will eventually be totally extinct. I got a letter from this guy, Jim, the other day, and he said, Shepard, you realize, of course, that natural selection and the evolutionary process will eventually make your type of man totally extinct. The questioners, the believers will finally win out in the end. Well, you know, it, it's, it's like the, the, the second time I went to Coney Island, I'm walking along, and they have a batting cage there. One of these cages where you put a quarter in the slot and this pitching machine pitches ten balls at you. And you stand up old Warren Louisville Slugger. Have you seen that thing? And you swing away at it, ten of them. And you can pick this, you can pick the kind of pitch you want. And you can set the meter. And there's one that says slow lobber. And just throws a lob ball. You know, the kind that fat guy's playing the skinny guys at the picnic. This kind of a ball. And then there's an underhand pitch by a left-hander. Slow, easy, comes in right over the plate. But it's not quite a lobber. You can set it all the way on up to, to Carl Hubble-type fastball. Ryan Dern dusts you off. And, and I, I'm standing there. I'm telling you an exact story. This is, the, this is truly what happened. I'm, I'm not I'm not embellishing this one bit. I, I want to see somebody, because I don't have the guts to step up to the plate, because I'm afraid of machines anyway, really. No, I, I would like to, I'd like to, uh, again, qualify that. I am not afraid of machines. As a matter of fact, I enjoy many machines. One of the most amusing aspects of the type of writer who writes for The New Yorker or many other magazines of that type is that he must always profess an inability to deal with any type of machine. Well, I think this is a, a kind of a childish attitude because most of us can deal with machines of one kind or another. It's when the machine begins to deal with us, of course, that the situation reverses itself. This whole, this whole theory was brought out by Thurber. Thurber is one of the great proponders, propounders of this. Well, of course, uh, I, I don't understand how the little buttons work and I press a button and the thing happens. And, and it's, it's a kind of feminine helplessness in the face of the things which we have created. But be that as it may, I'm walking along there, you see, and I see this batting cage. Now, this is a thing that has a deep primeval interest to all men. It's, it's, in a sense, it is a synthesis of life, which is a challenge, of course. 
was some machine off there in the darkness throwing fastballs down over the inside corner of the plate. And we'd better swing, boy. You don't get another one. And, and it is. It's a synthesis. And you put it. Everybody starts out with the same thing. Quarter in a slot. Throw it in there. It's like that big Mike Todd party. I'll, oh, I'll never forget that. You put a quarter in the slot. You start out. Everybody starts out the same. Mike Todd, guys living in the Bronx, other guys who learn how to be airplane pilots, guys who play second base for the... Do Everybody starts out with the same quarter, see? And I'm, I'm walking along that street in Coney Island. And, and by the way, I'd like to recommend this. If you ever go to Coney Island, go to Coney Island on the days when Coney Island really isn't working. Uh, the kind of off days, like at the end of the season or before the season really begins then you, you, in a sense, get much more of a clear picture of what mankind is up to when he creates these vast seaside Babylonian Bacchanal centers. And I'm walking along, and I see this batting cage over there. Now, for those of you who don't know what it is, a batting cage in the Coney Island sense is a cage. It's a big cage. And down at the, the other end of the cage, let's say the nether end of the cage, there's a big green curtain. And this green curtain says, home run. Or it says, pop up, out, strike out, that kind of thing. You see, wherever you hit the ball and, and you drive it up against that green curtain tells what kind of hit you got or what, what kind of out you made. And next to the home plate, there is a home plate down at our end of the cage. Next to the home plate is a rack that has maybe 25 terrible old clubs. They're not even bats, they're clubs, which is incidentally also, I believe, very uh, symbolic of our life. <laughs> so, so he picks up, the customer picks up one of these clubs, he pays his quarter, puts it in the slot, and sets the machine down at the other end, down there by that green, by that green curtain down there, is a machine that throws baseballs at you. This is true, you know, this machine does this. And this machine throws baseballs at you, and you can set a dial to determine what kind of balls you want thrown at you. Now, this is a perfect situation for the guy who's really working. Now, if you were to pick the kind of life, if you were to pick the kind of curveballs you want thrown at you in life, what kind would you pick? I mean, what kind do you hit the best? I mean, assuming that there is an element of chance in everybody's life, no matter how it's worked, what kind of curveballs would you want thrown at you? Well, let me tell you what happens. Generally speaking, you figured that you'd put in the quarter and you'd set the machine to throw these little looping balls that are thrown at you at the skinny guy, fat guy picnic softball game, you know? But the, the actual secret of it is when you're faced with it, you don't. You really don't. Because every man secretly likes to think that he is a Viking standing at the prow of this ship about to meet the biggest dragon in the Western Hemisphere and he's going to deal with them as best he can with a very small but very agile, very wiry lance. And so here I'm, I'm standing there waiting for some guy to come along. And it's one of those vaguely watery Saturday afternoons late in the season. After the last Ferris wheel rider has sort of disappeared in the distance and the last kid with the, with the Nathan hot dog has disappeared. And, and it, Coney Island is slowing up. And it's, it's the beginnings of October or November or something. There's a little cold air in it. And along comes a little guy. It's a true thing. And I'll, I'll remember this to the, to the dying day. Because I had Im implications of it this morning as I'm, I'm coming through Times Square, the watery sunlight coming down and the, the, the fountains of Rome still ringing in my ears. Do you know how it is to sit next to the Fontana de Trevi, Trevi, and, and watch nothing but glory, like starlings, tremendous hordes of starstruck Catherine Hepburn type, uh, type tourists gathering by the millions and throwing quarters into this this gigantic pot full of water. And I'm, I'm standing there watching this, and I, my mind goes back immediately to this little short fat man who somehow got himself involved with Coney Island on a Saturday afternoon. And he's work, working his way towards the sea, like all good lemmings. He's working his way in a solo way toward the sea. All of us, in one way or another, do work our way toward the sea, pulled ever, ever, ever by the primordial life. And so he's working his way down towards the sea, and I'm standing across the street waiting to see who's going to play this, this batting cage thing. And he stops and he looks in. 
He looks around and he notes that there are hardly anyone, hardly anyone on the street who can get away with it this time. And by the way, I think most of us, if we were given the choice, would play out our lives in absolute privacy so that no one suspects what we're doing. And this is all connected with the concept of original sin. And so <laughs> he's standing there looking the business over, reaches in his pocket and pulls out a quarter. And he pops inside the cage, throws his quarter in the slot, and looks back at the rack and picks himself out a bat, one of these great big worn clubs with tape on the handle. And it is interesting to note that he picked one of the largest bats in the rack, this little short, round man who had long since passed, had gone past the 45-year milepost long before. He picks up one of these tape bats and steps up to the plate. And I'm, I, I couldn't see how, I couldn't see how he had set the machine. And I figured, you know, naturally, I figured he's going to get this little lobbing ball that flies out from the fat man and the skinny man pitcher there. And the next thing I knew, this machine had let one go. You see, you set the meter, and the end meter all the way over at the end says Carl Hubble Bob Feller. That's nothing but a fast straight ball right over the outside corner of the plate, waist high. And he sets this thing, and it goes... Zoom! Like that, it went past him like a shot. And his bat just moved slightly. He steps up to the plate, kicks the dirt a little bit. He's waiting for the next one. I figured he's going to set the machine again, you know. He's waiting for the next one. He chokes up a little bit on the bat and hunches down over the plate. And you hear the machine go... Zoom! And it goes into the into the catcher's mitt back of it. They had a big concrete catcher's mitt. Zoom! And he looks down, steps back out of the box, and hitches up his pants. That's two strikes. Steps back into the box, and this time he, he chokes up on the bat a little more, hunches over, and I can see all of his old kid baseball playing is coming into the is coming into the picture again. This time he's kicking the dirt a little bit and hunching his left shoulder down. This time he keeps the bat sort of half over the plate, you know, hunched like Eddie Stanky used to. Eddie Stanky was not a naturally good batter. He just kept the bat hanging out over the plate all the time. And if the ball hit it, well, he was off, you see. That's that's the way he batted. And this is the way he... The guy's hunched down over there, and, and I can see this guy's been playing life like this all the time. And, and he just ticked it, a foul tip, that skitters off to the left of the plate and into the screen. <laughs> he steps back. He got a piece of it that time. He's got seven more coming now. You get ten balls for a quarter. And suddenly the machine wound up and threw him a change of pace. A small, easy, looping inside curveball, and he missed it. He swung like that. And he stepped back and protested the decision. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful, what a beautiful drama of man's inability to cope with his own ambitions. Speaking of ambitions and the inability to cope, this is WOR AM and FM New York. We'll be here until 2 o'clock this afternoon. Now, now the, the, point, the point that we're making here, which, of course, is no point at all, because most of life doesn't have much point, if you're ever going to be really objective about it, it's the, it's the, it's the sense that, that you can find, if you, if you look carefully, you can find a monkey pounding at all the closed doors of all the upper broadways on every Sunday afternoon of life. And I'm standing there last week. It seems I'm beginning, as you notice, but slowly but surely that long rubber band is beginning to pull me back into the vortex of the now, where we live at this time. And, and it's interesting to me to note that most people prefer me the other way, with my other self off somewhere in, in, in Bulgaria or Brussels and me here. Which I don't. I, this is an implied. I, I don't know. Is it an implied rejection or acceptance? I can't detect which. And it seems like just about three or four hours ago. Well, I, I did something. I, I'd like to recommend something to you. Uh, and this has nothing. I will put a disclaimer on it immediately. I have. This is no commercial. Uh, I did not. I, I had. I don't know anything about the people who who ran it or. In fact, all I did was go down and plunk down my money right there at the at the box office and go in. And there was a reason for it. That is why I wanted to see this. 
I was in Frankfurt, Germany. About, uh, oh, it's, it was last Thursday, as a matter of fact. I was there off and on during this trip I took. The reason Frankfurt was because Frankfurt is the home base of uh, the airlines on which I flew to Europe and back. Incidentally, I'll, I'll get the commercial right out of the way right now. That particular airlines was Lufthansa. And if you're looking for a really wonderful trip to Central Europe on the Boeing 707 jets, you know, we set a world's record, did I tell you, on the way over there? Uh, from Idlewild Airport, very peculiar to be involved in a world record thing and know that they're trying for a world record when you're sitting in the seat. But uh, we flew from Idlewild to Frankfurt, Germany, in six hours and 56 minutes, uh, which is kind of wild. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it's it's It's... A very rapid transit, all I can say. It has elements of all kinds of surrealistic parts of your life involved. But nevertheless, uh, I flew via Lufthansa, and if you're planning to go to Europe this coming uh, summer or spring, I would recommend a trip via this airlines. Excellent service, and they, they get you there. But anyway, uh, I spent some time in Frankfurt, and I spent most of the time in a, in a very old-world type hotel and there was talk all the time around this hotel of this new movie that was made uh, a new movie that had been made in and about this hotel and out in the courtyard next to it with uh, the street and all that whole area you see and it was about a girl named Rosemary you probably read stories did you read the story about her in life and that and the big picture story taken from the movie? Well, the story, briefly, I'm not even going to tell you the story, but because the important thing about this movie is that more than any other movie that I've ever seen, or any piece of literature I've ever seen, I have a great faith in the movie as, a, as, a, uh, as an art medium, as a medium for expressing things which cannot be expressed in any other area. They can go much beyond what Broadway can do. Uh, they can go much, certainly far beyond television, and I think uh, beyond almost any other medium, with the single exception, perhaps, of the novel, or, and I have to say this, the spoken word, because both of them can evoke great images within the, within the, uh, the imagination and I'm probably other areas of, of your mind that uh, cannot be evoked any other way. However, I'm standing in my hotel room, and I, I had no idea of what this was about. And I was a, about on the fourth or fifth floor. And they have big windows in this hotel, big swinging windows with very light, gauzy, white curtains. And I swung the windows back. And Germany, by and large, is a is a sunny country. It's cold, but there's a seems to me more sun uh, than we have during the winter time, during cold weather. And I swung the window open because it was a brilliantly sunny day. And the sun was hitting down in a, in a concrete courtyard next to me, next to the hotel. And across from this courtyard, there was a brand new, some kind of a, mm, it looked like a, a very uh, genteel sort of factory. Not a real factory, but, but something where some office building or some kind of industrial thing was going on. But it was, a, it was kind of vaguely... Uh, a vaguely, there's something even, even rural about many of the cities in in Germany. Strangely enough, in the middle of all of this, this uh, peculiar work and great driving energy that's going on. So I'm standing there looking down, and uh, I look down in this court court there for a while, and it had a an odd look of a set anyway, because of the way the big concrete abutments cut down, and you could see the light, a shaft of light hitting down on the concrete driveway, and I, I just looked down and looked at the sun and heard the sound of the traffic off in the distance and a few birds and things. And while I was doing that, a maid walked in, and uh, she was bringing in uh, stuff like towels and that, and she walked in, and she saw me looking out of the window. She didn't say much. They, they never say much unless you say something to them. And I said, it's, it's nice out there. And she said, that is where they shot the movie. I said, what? What, what, what? what movie is that? She says, well, the, the movie about Rosemary. You know about Rosemary? And I said, no, what about Rosemary? So she proceeded to tell me that, 
that in 1957 and 56, this girl, Rosemary, started right down there in that courtyard where she started her whole career, which uh, became a very wildly talked about career and at one time even threatened much of the, <laughs> of the economy of the area. She's a very interesting character. And so I went down the elevator, and I'm, I'm asking the elevator boy about this woman, Rosemary, and he knew all about her. All of them in the hotel knew. They, they had all been there for a long time, and they all knew all about her. And they were telling me stories about this woman. I've already done it. They were telling me stories about this woman. And so when I got back to the States, I went to see the movie, pri really primarily because I knew the area where it was shot, and I knew many of the types of people that were there. And I have never seen a more brilliant satire on a way of life. Uh, comments on yourself. You know, satire is a thing which is a very, and on one hand, it's a very ephemeral art form, and on the other hand, it's a dangerous art form. And it's a very difficult art form to really realize. Bad satire is, is, is awful. Good satire is brilliant. There's hardly any any in between. And this this satire, which is a satire on all the wildly wildly uh, industrial, strangely peculiar, uh, uh, in a sense almost, because I think man is is constantly worried with his conscience that the better off he has it in any country, the better off he has it. Right here, we we have all the physical comforts of any place in the world, the better off he has it, the more he begins to develop a, a sneaking sense of conscience about it. Somehow he feels that, that he shouldn't have all this, you know? That the more a person begins to be, for example, wealthy people almost always develop a conscience as they get older and older about it. And uh, they, they begin to do all sorts of things. They endow museums, they put money into Broadway plays, they send kids through college. They do all kinds of things. And then have a ghost come in and write their biography that tells how really they, gr they were great anyway. And there's always this sense, you see, that, that I shouldn't have this. And I found that the, the more a country begins to get this way, that, that big uh, physical uh, ownership of actual material property, the more it becomes concerned over its soul. And so here's Germany, you see. And one line in this picture was great. There were two industrialist wives, a German industrialist sitting there talking, and they're sitting at the bar of this very, very fancy, decadent place. And one says to the other, Oh, my husband Otto, she is. My husband Otto has gone to Russia again on another one of his business trips. And uh, the second wife says, uh, well, He's gone to Russia a lot of times there, hasn't he? And, she, and the first one says, oh, yes, and, and she's a great big fat woman. It was wonderful because just before they opened her mouth very wide, and she says, look at this, look at that. I have this most wonderful dentist. Look look at those teeth there, a wonderful dentist. Every one of them is kept. Every one, you'd never know it. Every one is kept. <laughs> and then, then she sits back in this, this, uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of upholstered stool that she was revolving on, wearing her, very fancy Parisian evening gown with pearls all over her. And she says, oh, yes, my, my Otto, he, he is very well liked in, in, in Russia. In Russia, they can really appreciate, a, uh, they can really appreciate an industrial capitalist. <laughs> and it was a comment on both systems and very funny. And uh, the this was definitely a beautiful satire on so much of the modern life, and including, by the way, the ability that many people have in Germany to completely forget the past very, very conveniently. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a beautiful piece of work, and if you have a chance to see it, see it. And I'd like to point out another thing, too, about it. If you know anything about the theater, Bertolt Brecht, the uh, German dramatist and theater man, the man who was more than Kurt Weill, really, responsible for the three-penny opera, even though in this country it is very uh, chic to think of the three-penny opera and all the other things that the two of them, the two did in collaboration as largely Kurt Weill. Uh, Kurt Weill was really just the man who wrote the music for the uh, theater pieces that Berthold Brecht wrote. And three penny You'll find a lot of the elements of Berthold Brecht in this particular piece of work. 
which is to say an, a very, very interesting moving back and forth between a strict realistic storytelling and then drawing back as a Greek chorus will, uh, drawing back and making a comment on what you have just seen in the same terms as what you have just seen. Uh, if I play any role in our society, my role is that of the Greek chorus. Uh, I am not a featured player. I am not a star. I do not, I do not uh, raise the dagger and plunge it into the heart of the enemy. I stand in the back, and once in a while, after the dagger has been raised and plunged, I sing the long dirge. Oh, woe, oh, woe, oh, mighty, mighty woe. Oh, time and man, oh, revenge, thou art sweet. And oh, revenge, thou shalt destroy all of us. And then, then the chorus rises, and the lights go up, and again the action takes place. <laughs> And this, this is a very necessary function. We have, we have in, our, in our society, we have somehow been able to bypass the Greek chorus, the, the chorus which both explains the action to the audience and to those who have just created the action. This is what the Greek chorus always did. And it provided an interesting frame to what was going on, and not only an interesting frame, but it, it provided a focal, a focal... Uh, point to it. And you'll see this in action if you see Rosemary. It's a beautiful piece of movie making. And uh, from time to time, the, uh, the, three, the three members of the Greek chorus will stroll through the street and will play upon their accordion and will sing. We'll sing, oh, oh, we have all, we have all of it now. We have money, we have love, don't we? And then they just stop. We have love, don't we? It's a thing that uh, I, I uh, of course, we have our Greek chorus, but most of our Greek choruses today are totally, are totally, uh, let's say, uh, unconscious that they are. The other day, I'm listening to the radio, and uh, I like to tune across. I have this little radio, and I listen back and forth because you are hearing, <laughs> you are hearing all the fears, all the the uh, strange dreams and fantasies. And all the odd idiosyncrasies and biases of our time are all poured into one thing, and the, one giant shouting voice. And there's one radio station, and I will use our call letters here because I do not wish to, you know, bring in anybody else. But there's one radio station that said something to me the other day that made my radio shed a tear. It's the first time I've seen plastic weep. It was a very interesting thing. And uh, it, 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 the guy had just played a record called Teen Angel. Teen Angel, Teen Angel. And, and then it's one of those radio stations, you know, that spends all of its time playing these teenage fantasy records, and uh, which are kind of borderline pornography. And uh, after, after every record, they shout loudly about the time and the temperature. As though the time... <laughs> Somebody pointed out to me that after you listen to one of those radio stations for enough time... And you're, you're walking around and you're living and you're... It always seems to be the same time of day. It always seems to be, it's now 421 and a half. <laughs> it's always the same time. And it's always the same temperature. And it's as though the time and the temperature were products of a show. That the time is now being produced. And so, who handles time? Is that an MCA package? Or does... Or does uh, that's uh, William Morris. I imagine William Morris. They got a big stable. I imagine they handle time. I, I figure MC, uh, MCA handles weather. They uh, do all the. Uh... <laughs> and, and in the middle of all of this, this guy gives the station break and he says, W O R. And now it's time once again for W O R News and W O R Time and W O R News and W O R Time. And now here's a W O R hit tune. <laughs> w O R loves you. And that's an exact transcript of a station break I heard, and my radio suddenly shuddered a little bit in this great tear because it was the first time that anyone had really told my radio that it was loved. Because I get pretty mad at it sometimes, and I often... You know how people are today. I mean, we, we forget the little things. I haven't brought it new batteries or anything in a long time. And it was just a wonderful thing to see. Uh, <laughs> and I could see this little old lady up in Queens somewhere who hasn't gotten a letter from her son now in 23 years. She hasn't heard from anybody in 23 years. Once in a while she hears from Peggy, 
but that's about all. And for 23 years, and she's, she's up there, and her radio one day tells her that she is loved. And, and can't you just see those china blue eyes puddling up over that, over that, that lace collar? And, and, and this, this, uh, this wonderful, this wonderful sense of having finally arrived. Yes. It's, it's as though we're always clinging. Toe hold and foothold, and we can see that big rock overhanging way, way up there. It's like when I'm this kid and I'm, I'm walking through, of course, hot summer evenings. And, and walking through a tabernacle. You know what is it, a tabernacle when you're a kid? Uh, this is a different from being a tabernacle when you're an adult. A tabernacle when your kid is full of all kinds of lightning and thunder and, and smells of sawdust and sweaty bodies and hot, hot summer evenings with, with eyes just outside of that corrugated tin house where the tabernacles used to be always played out. It's that old Greek problem of tragedy, unrequited love, and the final, final revenge of it all. And I can hear that voice looking down. And voices did, you know, in those days. They didn't speak to you. They looked at you. They raged and ranted about you. They looked up at you and looked down at you. And I can remember the voice of this, this reformed barber who had become a tabernacle preacher in our hometown, looking down at all of us, every one of us. The time has come for you to look within your hearts and say... And it rose and rose. And by George, that summer heat in great shimmering waves continued to reach up to those long flying clouds. Speaking of clouds and the edges of dreams. an example of folk musicianship. <laughs> Speaking of the folk, uh, somebody, you know, a couple of days ago, we were talking about the idea. Of course, the business of this guy swinging in the Fountain de Trevi, uh, I was was very interested when I'm, I'm standing back in a doorway overlooking the Fontana de Trevi, which is a very beautiful, considered generally the most beautiful of the fountains in Rome. Of course, it depends on what, what your concept of beauty is, but it, it certainly is a, a very impressive thing. You probably saw it in, uh, in the Catherine Hepburn movies, all the, all the uh, romantic things that are done about Rome all the time. So I'm standing back in a doorway uh, looking out at the Fontana de Trevi, the Fountain of Trevi, and uh, watching the people there. And there was an old Italian, uh, a guy who uh, who was in probably his 80s, and he had a big round face, and he must have had five chins. And he was, he was sitting there on the top rung of the metal fence that uh, surrounds the basin of the fountain, and he had a big watch chain across his, his vest, and he had a huge, he was huge, he must have weighed about 300 pounds. And he's sitting there, and he has a cane, and he has a twinkle in his eye, and he has an absolutely white set of handlebar mustaches. And I'm, I'm watching this guy. So he's sitting there, and, and I begin to realize, after about 10 minutes of watching him carefully, because I knew that this was, this was too well composed, that what he was doing, he was assuring himself of immortality. He was appearing in every second photograph that was being taken by, by the 50,000 people who went through. He didn't charge. He just wanted to be in the picture. It wasn't a matter of charge. He just sat there and looked picturesque, which was his only talent in life, obviously. He looked picturesque, and he knew it. 
And he was all part of showbiz. And I, I can see this guy morning putting on his makeup and his costume and getting his, his mustaches curled and waxed. And he's coming down to sit before the Fontana de Trevi to ensure his immortality. That, that he knows, of course, uh, the, the millions of people that are taking photographs of this thing all the time, that at least one out of every two are going to say, now, what I want to do is take a shot. Now, shh, don't, don't, don't disturb him, because it's very difficult to, to take pictures, you know. I don't want these people to notice. I'd just like to have him outlined. You see, the, the right foreground there with the fountain behind, the sun coming up. It's, it's wonderful. It's just wonderful, that old man there. This old clown sat on the top of that fence. I watched him for over four hours. And once in a while, he would turn just a little bit so that he would get good lighting on his face. See, the sun was changing all the time. And he would turn and move just a little bit, and he would change his cane, and he would drape his, his coat just a little. And all the while, this entire performance was, was uh, surrounded and, and sort of inundated by an obligato, the great rushing sound of millions of shutters being clicked, and billions of feet of film running through film spools. <laughs> And, and other guys, of course, uh, scratch their initials in wet concrete. Others write novels. Other guys go to the tabernacle, and everybody takes his own takes his own tack. They all they're all trying in some way or another. And speaking of of the business of of writing your names on things, I was uh, at the Victor Emanuel monument, which uh, is a tremendous thing growing up out of the out of the heart of Rome. It's, it's called the wedding cake. Of course, everyone knows about it, so I won't even go into it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monstrosity of, of overdone imagination, overblown imagination, gigantic bronze horses and women playing quoits with victory wreaths. The whole business, it's all this huge thing going on there. And I, and I, I work my way all the way up to the top of it so you can look down over the whole city of Rome and these gigantic, these tremendous Roman columns are stretching up over your head, maybe nine stories, huge things. And all of them are completely covered with the names of people who have been here, all those names written in there. Millions and millions of little names. <laughs> Everybody's trying to, trying to make sure that... that <laughs> that's right. Everybody's trying to make sure that when, when this piece of crockery is dug up in the year 2,428, their name will be on it. And you know, the interesting thing to report is that when they did dig up some of the Roman ruins of uh, the Forum and several of the victory, or, or at least the arches in Rome, in the Forum area, they did find names of Roman proletariats scrawled on them. And that's, that's kind of comforting to know that some little clown, <laughs> some little guy... <laughs> Uh, some some little forerunner to to a guy who runs a uh, a shoe repair shop on the outskirts of Rome left his imprint on the great vast ruined forum of history, <laughs> and I'm sure that each one of us, when we throw our quarter into that slot, would automatically set it for the fastest ball a machine could throw, knowing full well, of course, that in the end, that we're lucky if we can hit that slow lobbing in curve even for a, for a fairly decent foul ball. And so you look up at that old sky. It's, 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 it's like the other day when I was talking about the rubber stamps, you know. Uh, there is something, something majestic about a climate in which the rubber stamp can flourish as greatly as it does flourish. And I just received a letter from a guy, and he's written my name in big black print on a piece of paper and over it with a rubber stamp over the name Gene Shepard well, the rubber stamp is the simple word and the fantastically complex word fulfilled. Wouldn't you love to have a rubber stamp that says fulfilled? And, and this is all part of what we're doing with our language today. There was a time in, in uh, industrial organizations when you finished an order and you had to stamp it, you'd stamp done, or you'd stamp completed. Or you'd stamp down at, uh, checked out, uh, April 7th, 1962. Checked. But today, the words have become other things. And an organization doesn't do its duty. It fulfills. 
And the man who sent this to me put at the bottom of it, he put a little note. He says, I secured this rubber stamp, and this is a true story. I secured this rubber stamp through a big corporation's purchasing department. <laughs> Gene Shepard fulfilled. And then you begin to understand when you put that old quarter in that slot there. Oh, boy, I'm going to level. It's going to be a high, hard one. It's like the other night I get a call from Marty Geisler who runs the paper book gallery and and uh, this is a this is a very secret thing we're just going to have to we're just going to have to put it on the air now marty is a man of peculiar propensities uh he's the guy who put the uh the uh, penguin in the doorway to the paper book gallery here a couple of months ago and uh, he is also the creator of the whole concept of the paper book gallery and if you are making the village scene this coming weekend I would certainly highly recommend a visit to the gallery, uh, and and a village scene or not. I mean, if you're if you're a person who is looking for, as I am always looking for, new things to buy, I think that the that the purchasing a book today is a new kind of placebo. I really do. I think that the that the buying of a paper book is tied up with with our conscience. It's tied up with our feeling of inadequacy. I just wonder how many paper books are actually read that are bought. You're kind of paying obeisance to something, some unknown, some great god. Uh, it's some, some unknown, unseen god of culture when you buy them. Did you see that great cartoon by Didini? I believe it was Didini in uh, the New Yorker of the past week. Once in a while, I have a cartoon that really has meaning. And it shows a couple of natives, just plain ordinary natives with blowguns. And standing next to the native is a gigantic stone idol. A tremendous stone idol. This idol must be about 40 feet high, and it's got this uh, just omnipotent stone face. Its eyes are half closed, and it's staring off in the distance, this gigantic idol. And this little guy who's about as high as the instep of this idol is standing there, and he has shot, he shot a dart at it like that. <laughs> and the dart, of course, has bounced off of the stone, and another native is saying to another one in the background, this is a senseless... A, a, a senseless revolt against authority. <laughs> oh, time, oh, place, oh, considered thought, oh, spin indeed on. I think I'm going to try the medium fastball this time. Just give me a quarter and I'm ready for business. I'll be back in 15 minutes. This is WOR Radio, your station for news. Okay, don't, don't just don't 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 push me. I, I I can't. There are times when I just can't face reality, and time is one of those things. I mean, one of the realities. Oh, of course, this is an abstraction. It it reminds me, if if I might uh, digress here momentarily, it, it reminds me of this thing that I saw at a party about oh six or seven or maybe eight weeks ago. I'm at this party. I'd say maybe about oh. Seven or eight times a year, most of us have to face the way it really is. Now, now, generally speaking, I would say that we are usually in a position to turn our backs on the way it really is and casually walk off down the street uh, humming an inconsequential hum to ourselves and considering the weather. I mean, you know, it's a thing. We can do this. But then there are other times when the reality of a thing is brought right down in front of us. It's like your batting average. There it is. I figure that one day when I arrive before the vast eternal bar of justice and this, this vast eternal judge of them all is sitting up there at his great big desk looking down and looking over my record, I'm going to stand there and I'm going to say, before you do anything, Your Honor, about my case, I'd like to point out I've got a bad knee. <laughs> I mean, you know, and so I'm I'm at this party, and it's a party. And today, parties are homogenous things. The the, the the beats and the hips mingle equally with the squares and the uptowners. And I'm I'm kind of representing. You know, I'm just there. I'm representing my constituency, which is me. In the middle of this party, and this friend of mine comes up to me, and we're sitting there talking a little bit. You know, just generally mingling around, and, and, and suddenly he says, say, he says, look, look, at, look at that couple over there that just came in. 
and two of the most beautiful bronzed people you ever saw in your life came in. I mean, you know the kind of guy, the tall, thin guy who wears the stuff in the mail magazines? And he has this little Tyrolean hat, and his face is sort of bronzed, and he's got the sort of vaguely uh, golden curly hair, and the chick he's with is about 5 feet 10, thin, willowy girl wearing Toreador pants, and, of course, the orange complexion, this beautiful, smiling, brilliant, crisp people type things. And they both came in, and uh, they, they really looked... I mean, they, they were right out of, of all the better homes and the modern world type things. And they walked into the room there, and all the rest of us uh, inadequately struggling away. The beats are not quite making it as beats, and the squares are not quite square enough. And everyone's going, and the radio is playing, and the record player is playing, and the TV set is yapping away over in the corner there, and the ice cubes are rattling, and you can hear the sound of, of ginger ale being... And all the whole business is going on. It's one of these parties, and it's hot and sweaty, and there's always somebody who's turned the radio to one of those little slum radio stations way down at the bottom of the dial where guys are talking real fast and they're playing this incomprehensible music all the time, and three or four of them are kind of sinuously dancing in the crowd. It's a real party party. And the guy says to me, wow, look at sociables. And they were. They were true sociables. The, the real sociables, you know the kind, the kind you see standing next to a barbecue in the backyard in the ads? And he's got his sweater tied around his neck by the, by the arms. He just finished a game of tennis, and she's just finished some other kind of game. Is getting ready to start another kind of game. You can tell, and they're both standing there holding the soft drink bottle in their hands. And, and these two came into the party. It was a beautiful picture, really. I, when you see what mankind can really be, you, you can't help but have faith in mankind. I mean, really. And, and these two people were kind of a forerunner of the new man. You know, the new man with the wraparound vision and uh, the, the whole business, all automatic, completely automatic. The new man is going to be completely automatic, automatic steering, automatic power drive. The whole business is going to be automatic and all transistorized. No old-fashioned tubes have trouble with mews. And and uh, <laughs> and uh, bad bias voltage. I mean, you know, the biases are killing man anyway. And, and you're not going to have any of that trouble with the new man. And, and these two were forerunners of the new race of man, which you can see in all the ads, you know. Uh, they're there, they're there. And so they came in, and this guy nudged me in the elbow. And he's a short guy with thick glasses, by the way. A terrible situation developed later about this. Uh, he was standing uh, later on in the party. This is, uh, I'm describing a 20th century party for you. Uh, it was right out of Kafka. Uh, later on, this poor little guy was standing over by the punch bowl, when suddenly a TV announcer in the crowd hit him in the face because he figured he had insulted him. And, and of course, TV announcers, being what they are, figure that the world is about to insult them all the time anyway. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, you know, if, if I were to walk up to your door, let's think about this for a minute. If I were to walk up to your door and I were to knock, that's an insistent knock. Did you hear about this landlady that wouldn't answer the knock? Did you read that in the paper? The, the rent commission sent all the cops and everything down after this landlady, and they knocked. They knocked. This is just in the paper yesterday, in the Times. They knocked on her door for four hours in shifts. These guys are knocking on her door. They knew she was in there. <laughs> so she finally came out, and they dragged her off to the pokey with about 422 rent violations. And then her doctor appears in the court and says, well, of course, she has what we call regressive uh, anxiety and nervousness. He's, and then the judge says, well, what do you mean? What is this What is this regressive anxiety and nervousness? He said, well, if people were knocking on your door for four hours, you'd be nervous too. And the judge picked the book and threw it at both of them. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a great world to live in. I mean, when this happens... By the way, she was a kindly gray-haired woman who looked exactly like a Norman Rockwell painting with a thing underneath it that says, My Mother. And uh, so this is all part of it. And... And I'm standing in this in the middle of this party, and this guy nudges me, and he says, look. He says, look, a, a couple of sociables. And I looked up, and by George, he was right there were two sociables. And, and, and the sociables were standing over there by the TV set, and they, they have a certain way of posing. The new modern man somehow always looks good, no matter what light you see him in. You know this. And whether he's worrying about something, you see him in the, in the ads for TV Guide, you know when he's worrying about whether to make the big decision, what radio station to use, he looks good no matter what he does. 
He's a work of art, man is. There's no question about it. I mean, he's better than the Sphinx and everything. And so these two sociables were, were sociabilizing over there, and, and uh, the party goes on, and I, I saw them from time to time. I could see the, the flash of a well-turned ankle and once in a while the, 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 the glitter of a, of a beautiful pair of scrub teeth. And they, they were over there, and they were sociabilizing. And the evening wore on, as evenings and parties wear on. And maybe two or three hours went by, and the smoke is getting, and my eyes are hurting, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I can make my getaway. And, and you know, this, this whole thing of the party is getting hot and steamy, and the, 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 the radio is still tuned down there at the end of the slum. And then this girl came in. There's a funny bit there with the girl. She came in, and, and she walked right up to me, and she says, You're Gene Shepard, aren't you? And I says, That is correct. And with that, she fell flat on the floor in front of me, dead to the world. <laughs> Plump. I said, Oh... And uh, I said to the guy next to me, what do we do, pick her up? And she says, no. She looked up from the floor. She says, no, I'm perfectly able to get up myself. With that, she got up and weaved off into the crowd. It's a brilliant moment. <laughs> and so I'm standing there in the middle of the party, and, and uh, the, the sociables are there. You know, they're kind of a catalyst in, in this great sea of halogens that we are part of. When suddenly there's a little excitement over in the corner. You know that you, 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 there's a wave of excitement goes through the crowd that you know something has happened. Something not good, like someone has dropped a bottle out of the window or some terrible thing has happened. The cop has come in or something like that. Well, I could see this crowd over there by the TV set. And uh, I, I went over there, naturally, and I, I looked in through the crowd. And here, sitting right on her haunches, right flat out on her duff, is this chick in the Toreador pants with the little black vest with the big silver buttons on it and the cashmere sweater. And, and she is weeping, and, and somebody is down there pouring water on her head, and three guys are holding this, this male type that she's with away from her. And he's, and he's like that, and his, his white teeth are gleaming in the darkness, and his, his orange complexion right out of the ads is now purple. And you can see Pepsi-Cola all over his feet, and like that. And I said, what happened? And somebody says he hit her in the mouth. And the only thing I could figure is that he got too sociable. And I, I thought, you know, <laughs> boy, uh, yes, sir. And, I, and I, I walked away into the crowd, and I could hear the, the, the uproar going on. And the, the, and the next thing that happened, of course, was my friend got it in the face from the TV announcer. And uh, ten minutes later, I'm on the subway going uptown. Boy, I mean, you know, it's it's good to be. I I, I tell you, I it's 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 kind of like holding an ice cube in your hand, and the old ice cube is is melting away there, and in a sense, you begin to feel that the ice cube isn't even cold if you hold it long enough, and you forget it's cold. And once in a while, you can get into the shower and you turn on the hot water, and the hot water pours out and sears your skin, and you say, "Wow, is this cold?" Uh, it's all part and very closely related, you see, to the, the same, the same, uh, the, the same reactions. The time I'm walking through Fountain Square in Cincinnati. Now, now all of this might seem to you to be a melange of nothingness. But it isn't really a melange of nothingness. Not, not at all, because it is a melange of our, our life, the existence we live. And, and, and if you're going to be fulfilled, you've got to live your existence out. You've got to play out the string. It's, 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 it's just the natural course of events. And I'm walking through Fountain Square in Cincinnati one time. And uh, this is a Midwestern city of some renown. And I'm walking through this Midwestern square. And suddenly I see another crowd, a great big crowd. And I look up where the crowd is looking. And there's a guy hanging on the outside of a 15-story building. And he's running up and down the side, actually the side of the bricks, right on the side of the building. And everybody says he's going to commit suicide. He's going to commit suicide. And, and I said, oh, no, no. And everyone has this look of horror on their face. And there's a man 12 stories up running up and down the side of the building. He's wearing a white T-shirt and a pair of black pants and, and, you know, just running up and down the side of the building. It was an amazing exhibition. And I says, no, no. And someone says, yes, he's going to commit suicide. And the police arrived, and they had nets. And the fire department arrived, and they put up ladders. And the guy is being chased from window to window by the cops who are looking out of the windows. And he's running around on the outside of the building, clinging to the bricks. And the crowd is saying he's going to commit suicide. Oh, no, no. And, and the sun is shining down, and it's a brilliant summer afternoon. And here I am, caught in the swirling vortex of life itself again. 
men attempting a senseless revolt against that great stone face of authority. And he's running up and down the side of the building, and suddenly the guy runs around the building, and he's clinging to a drain pipe or something. He's going shinnying up and down, and the next thing that happens, he goes right up to the side of a uh, what looked like a great big fire escape, and he unrolls a big sign that came out of his pants or something, a big sign that unrolled, and it said, The circus opens today at 3. Get your tickets at the box office. And everybody stood there, and, and they, 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 I could feel the anger rising up in the crowd. He was the Cincinnati human fly. And I could feel the anger rising up in the crowd, and I couldn't figure out whether the anger was because they couldn't go to the couldn't go to the circus that afternoon or because the guy really didn't commit suicide and, and knew where he was all the time. And, of course, they hauled him off to the pokey for disturbing the peace. Actually, he gave Cincinnati the biggest show that, he ha that it had since Taft lost the nomination. And that was a big show in itself. And so <laughs> I, I walked out, and I felt vaguely disappointed, vaguely disappointed. And, and the Cincinnati human fly has remained with me throughout all these years. I can still see that man clinging to the edge of a building and people saying he's going to do it. He is going to do it for all of us. It's so like that little old lady. Did you read this thing that, that came out of the United Press? A beautiful little... Be, speaking of little old ladies, we have WOR AM and FM with us here in New York. And uh, we'll be here until, oh, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Time is only of a of a of a of a measuring, and you, you can't if you put the quarter in. Maybe if you did hit that slow ball and belted it out into the upper deck, it isn't the same thing as belting that fast inside hooker, that that screw ball that nobody can qu you, you can reach and then you can't reach. Is he going to do it or isn't he? Rich players out there in Queens do it. Golfers on New Jersey greens do it. They all enjoy Rhine Gold beer. New England yachtsmen in style do it. Picnickers on Staten Isle do it. They all enjoy Rhine Gold beer. No other beer is like Rhine Gold. It's refreshingly dry. New York's favorite beer. Clean, clear, refreshing. And the bright taste tells by more millions that end of day do it. Even rival brewers, well, they may do it. So do it. Enjoy Rheingold beer. Rheingold is New York's largest selling beer. <laughs> oh, boy, you know, it's... it's uh... Uh, who was it who said it? Uh, it was James Joyce one time. Said that, or somebody, if it wasn't James Joyce, it was me who said it. I know that I've said it. <laughs> Everybody else has probably said it in one way or another at, at one time or another. But there is within all of us, each one of us, I mean the kids, I mean the people, I mean the grown-ups and the non-grown-ups, there is within us a little dark lump of something that is the unutterable or the inutterable. It's, it's the thing which we all know or suspect uh, but can't say. And I'm sitting here, and it's, it's kind of almost summer, really. I can see that sun coming down over the river, that old devil river out there. Once in a while, one of those big ocean liners moves out to sea, and I can I can feel the vibration in the air. And in a few months, few weeks, really, people lounging out there at Jones Beach, and the sun is going to be hitting down at that angle, and the sound of the hot dogs being fried on the hot plate is going to echo throughout the land. And it's 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 a sense of incipient excitement. And yet, deep down within us uh, is this thing that cannot be uttered, this inutterable thing. It's like this beautiful little news note. Again, it's it's uh, it's an attempt to recapture something that none of us can ever quite put into words, can never quite understand, can never quite feel. 
Uh, what was it? A couple of a couple of hours ago, Jim, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm sitting here, and I'm ready to go on the air. And I say to Jim, who's the engineer on with us this morning, I says, Jim, uh, you know, it's like you have just gotten your amateur radio operator's ticket this morning, and you, you're you tuning up this Tri-Tet 2A5 push-pull oscillator on 40-meter CW, and you are about to try to make your first contact legally. And that excitement, that excitement of beginning something beginning something is the excitement that many people carry throughout their entire lives, people like Bertrand Russell and a few others, that that feeling of, of always looking at everything as if it is a completely new thing, and you can't phony it up. I've known guys who have tried to do it, but you can't. Once you've rounded that bend, once you have begun to accept your own life, your own life uh, casually, as a matter of course, there just is no going back. You cannot bring back that old excitement. And I guess that's why many of the more jaded people spend most of their time going to the theater. It seems to me that the more jaded a person is, the more interested he is in attending the theater. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about people who create theater. That's another thing. But the, the great theater addicts are almost always people who are jaded with their own lives. Uh, this is also true of a person who incessantly reads. Uh, this is also a problem because they cannot, they're not, they're not living anything of their own. And whatever it is that they are living, they're not finding any excitement in it. And so they have to go through the lives of other people to, to vicariously let Kim Stanley do it for us, to vicariously let the Jason Robards feel the great excitement <laughs> that I'm no longer able or capable of feeling or perhaps never was capable of feeling them. And then, in the end, you wonder whether or not anybody really is, except in their imagination, capable of feeling the great emotions that are portrayed on the stages and in the novels. Because these novels, you know, are works of the imagination. Uh, the people who portray them on the stage are working with their imagination. And so, in the end, uh, you, you get the feeling sometimes that somebody is playing the harmonica for somebody else. And they're both trying to pretend that the music is great and awe-inspiring, and yet it has no basis in the music that's inside of everyone. So you're trying to say it. It's, it's, it's like my grandmother. I remember I had this grandmother who was a professional grandmother. There are some people who uh, kind of slip into grandmotherdom and, and never really are. They're mothers. They're never really grandmothers. But then there are grandmothers who at the age of 22 are grandmothers. And this, uh, it's impossible to really think of a real grandmother as ever being 22. But I had this grandmother who was a true grandmother. And I remember my grandmother one time taking me to the dime store. And, and I used to love to go to dime stores. Saturday afternoon and dime stores were synonymous in my youth. And uh, I remember going to the dime store with my grandmother. And the, going to the dime store on this particular Saturday afternoon in the springtime was for my grandmother to buy a new pair of glasses. She bought her glasses in the dime store. Do they still sell glasses in the dime store? They really sold glasses in the dime store. And there was a whole collection of glasses. And I mean eyeglasses. I don't mean sunglasses. I mean glasses glasses. The kind of glasses that, that elderly people put on when they read. And the kind of glasses that tall, thin men wear when they're working in the library. The rim, and, and there was Grandmother looking down at this collection of glasses. And, and she's putting them on her nose and, and reading the Sears Roebuck catalog or something when she did it to see whether or not they worked. And I'm standing there, and Grandmother has a pair of glasses with black rims, the very thin kind of round black rim glasses with the little gold earpieces and the gold thing that goes over the nose, and it had white tape at all junctures. And there was a big chip out of one glass, and these were the glasses she was throwing away, which she had purchased in this same dime store maybe five years before. And she's, she's saying to the woman behind the counter, do you have any, any Model 3ABs here? Uh, this is what my glasses are. They're Model 3AB here. And that was the ones that she was getting ready to... And, and the woman behind the counter says, we, we don't carry that model any longer. Which meant, of course, that my grandmother's eye ailment was now out of style, whatever it was that she had. 
And and my grandmother always kept in line with the with the latest styles as far as a grandmother could on a limited budget. She was like everybody else. I would like to just once get a job or do a show at one place once where the first thing that the producer says to me is, look, the first thing I want to tell you, son, don't worry about the money or the budget. It's unlimited. <laughs> Every job I've ever had, the first thing they say to me is, well, of course, you got to under got no dough. There must be some place where they've got all the dough. There, and, and how do you get into that? Every time I write an article for a magazine, the first time, the first thing they say to me is, of course, you realize that uh, we don't have any money, but we have artistic, uh, we have artistic standards. And I, I want to get to the place where they have the opposite. A lot of dough, no artistic standards. Then I can get away with murder. M E R D E R. Murder. <laughs> Depends on whether you speak French or not. And so I'm working my way through this through this dime store with my grandmother, you know. And and she she, <laughs> she says she says to the to the woman, Well what what uh, what are the newest styles? And this woman gave her a pair of glasses. And and uh, my grandmother put them on and she, she, I could see her eyes are kind of boggling behind them. And the woman says to my mother, my grandmother, she says, Well, of course, this year uh, most people are nearsighted. And my grandmother says, oh, oh, I see. And, and I'm standing there, a little kid. I'm hanging on the edge of the counter looking at these glasses being tried on. And, and my grandmother says, oh, uh, this is a kind of thing. I, I imagine I can get used to them. It's like women all getting used to pointy shoes today. And nobody has pointy toes. But they're all getting used to them. I think we're going to grow up. I was looking at Harper's Bazaar today, and it, this is one of the most grotesque magazines in the world. Fantastic. They, they, it's a great hymn to a non-femininity. There isn't a single feminine thing in the whole magazine. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a hymn to ego. Another thing entirely. I mean, I suppose this is femininity, I suppose, in a way, uh, in these magazines. But nevertheless, uh, here's my grandmother trying to get used to nearsighted glasses when she's farsighted, merely because it is now the, it is now the fashion to be nearsighted. And you could buy glasses for for twenty cents or twenty five cents, maybe fifty cents, maybe a dollar in the in the five to a dollar stores of it. Do they still sell? Does anybody know, really, where you can buy if you can buy glasses in the dime stores around anymore? And and they just try these glasses on, and finally my grandmother says, "I'll take these." She says, "I'll take these," and she put on a pair of glasses, and she says, "I'll take my old ones along." And her old glasses were so old and so worn that they, they just flopped over and bent in the middle. There was tape holding them together, big white chunks of tape. And she put them in her purse, and she put on her new glasses. And I'm leading my grandmother, and it's like she's always walking up a hill. Uh, she kept saying, uh, is this an awful hill here, Jeannie? And she always called me Jeannie, which made me turn green at the edges. And she says, it's awful hilly here, isn't it? And I says, no, those are your new glasses, Grandma. She says, yes, I'll get used to these glasses. Don't worry. And by George, my grandmother turned from, from farsighted to nearsighted within six months. And I'll never forget the, the uh, sad thing that happened to her. About four or five years later, uh, glasses came out in the dime stores that were for the newest current rage, which was tunnel vision. Do any of you know anything about tunnel vision? Grandmother never got used to that. She uh, just never quite made it with the pointy toes. Uh, speaking of pointy toes, we have with us the, the paper book gallery. And I, I don't want to run past this too quickly. Uh, the paper book gallery is down in the village, and Marty Geisler called. Now, this is the thing which is only for the poor few soreheads who are spending a sunny afternoon ruminating. And obviously, that's all you're doing. You are vegetating. I have a friend who was able to grow mushrooms out of his back one time, just by thinking hard enough about it, and by uh, kind of a yeasty, <laughs> a kind of a yeasty side to life that you just can't ignore, it uh, proved to be a rather profitable avocation. He had a little trouble with shirt sizes, though, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, Marty Geisler has been has been having trouble with guys coming down into the paper book gallery, looking him right in the eye, and various other clerks of his down there, and looking them right in the eye and saying, "Excelsior." Now, now, this is yes. Now, now, do you you know what Excelsior means, don't you? 
uh, we will not we will not go any further. I mean, Excelsior has a really deep hidden meaning in our lives, and certainly in my life, as as I as I lie on those snowy slopes holding the sign up, with the touch of the frozen north upon my brow, and the old the elderly farmer looking down at me. I don't know what happened there. He died with the words Excelsior on his lips. <laughs> well, anyway, Marty has uh, just out of one of those whims, and it has really it has nothing to do with a commercial gimmick, out of one of those whims, has laid in a stock of, of buttons, which he designed himself, which say nothing but Excelsior, you fathead. <laughs> And, and he will make these buttons available free to anyone who comes to one of the two paper book stores, looks his clerk right in the eye, and says in a loud, clear, ringing voice, Excelsior, you fathead. And without a word of demur, the clerk will reach under the counter and hand you a button that says the same thing, which you can flash if things get rough at a party. Excelsior, you fathead. So if you are going down to the paper book gallery, do that. It's a rubber stamp that, in a sense, says, fulfilled. <laughs> I would like to have a rubber stamp. Incidentally, Marty, if you're listening, what button made out that merely says fulfilled on it? I think that's much better. And, and that will worry all the people who vaguely feel they are not fulfilled if they see a man sporting a button that says he is and, of course, in, a, in the end, this could grow to be a vast... It could almost grow to be a, a tremendous theological movement. Because this is what we're all looking for anyway, in addition to Godot himself. So this is the paper book gallery. They will be open until 2 o'clock this morning down in the village. And with the, with, the, with the tiny, tiny, tinkling silver bells of spring in the air, the paper book gallery and the whole village is standing on tippy-toe, waiting to welcome the muse. Uh, the muse of the free soul moving as a wraith of smoke through the rainbow-hued horizon of existence. <clears throat> it's not bad. Oh, somebody called and says they do sell glasses uh, on Lower East Side, on the Lower East Side from push carts and in the five and dimes in Queens. It is quite true that Queens is roughly 15 years behind. And there, they're still out. In the five and ten cent stores in Queens, you can still buy a pair of glasses. Now, the glasses... <laughs> you know, I have a feeling I'm going to go into one of these dime stores and I'm going to buy myself a pair of glasses. Ten cent glasses or twenty cent glasses. Just, just to... This is a, this is a part of... Uh, you know, the, did you know that in certain, certain dime stores in the south side of Chicago, when I was a kid... Now, I know that you're not going to believe this, and this is not a, a program, I have to say it, devoted to nostalgia. It's a program <laughs> devoted to trying to hit the fastball thrown by the vast pitching machine of life, knowing full well that even if you do hit it, it's only going to hit a, it's only going to hit a concrete backdrop, and that all you win, if you do win, is a, is a plastic Cupid doll. Uh, when I was a kid, Jim, you remember, see if you see if this happened in New York. When I was a kid, on the south side of Chicago, in the dime stores, the five to a dollar stores in that area. Now, my uncle, my uncle often bought. And I had an uncle named Tom, who who was an interesting man. Uncle Tom was the bootlegger in our family, and he wore gray spats, and he had a gigantic dog named King an enormous German shepherd dog that was the first man-eater I ever met. And this was this was Uncle Tom. But Uncle Tom had a, an odd idiosyncrasy. Uncle Tom, the necessities of life, he never spent for. Never. He had he lived in a stucco house. I don't know what... Is there such a thing anymore today as stucco? Well, he lived in a gray stucco house that had all over this stucco house in Beverly Hills on the south side of Chicago in the very hip, chic neighborhood where all the bootleggers lived. He had a stucco house that was gray. It was kind of tattletale gray. And it, it had all kinds of little stickly things on the outside. You know, stucco always had little little kind of uh, kind of like like little prongs and little pointy things. It was it was it was very rough. It was like very thick sandpaper, this stucco house. And it was gray, but it had sprinkled all over the stucco. 
You see, stucco was kind of like plaster or something. It had broken pieces of red and green and yellow glass so that in the sunlight, this, this house was blinding. It was fantastic. That was the kind of house that Uncle Tom lived in. And I, when I'm a kid, you know, I used to go out there in the sun. I'd stand next to that, that house and I'd look at, I'd just look at the glass there. And one day I'm, I'm taking all the green, the green emeralds out of the side of this thing. And Uncle Tom came out and he says, stop that. And I said, why, well, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, kids, what, 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 what? I pretend that uh, I'm not doing it and he knows I'm doing it. He says, you can't take the jewels off my house. And I thought this was a kind of a good line. I, I'm, I'm thinking for, for a long time this would be a nice title of a short story. And so Uncle Tom lived in a stucco house. It had jewelry all over the side of it. But Uncle Tom did one thing which I will never, ever forget. Uncle Tom used to buy his false teeth from, from a guy who sold false teeth by mail, and they also sold false teeth in the dime store. And Uncle Tom had a dime store pair of false teeth that he used for everyday eating. His, his false teeth that he bought by mail for nine ninety five he used for Sundays and for company. Now, there you know, there you are. And I, and I remember one day Uncle Tom complaining bitterly that he had to go down to Kresge's to buy a new pair of teeth. And they were made out of plastic, and he used to keep them in a glass. And I can remember waking up at, at maybe 5, 6, you know, kids wake up early in the morning. Nobody in my family ever wore false teeth. I lived in a non-false teeth family. And I can remember at, at 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm waking up in the stucco house with the jewels all over on the outside of it and the sun just coming, coming over, just coming over the stockyards, beginning to hit those green jewels. And I walk into the john there as a kid, you know, and there is a big glass right there looking at me from the mirror, the little shelf under the mirror, a big glass with a pair of teeth smiling at me from the time store. And I used to look at those teeth, and those teeth would look back at me. And I, I, I always had the funny feeling when I left, when I left the John, after I, that, that I was impolite because I didn't say hello. Or something. <laughs> so if you're going to the paper book gallery, just say to them today, Excelsior, you fathead, and stand back and see what happens. <laughs> I would wait. If this tall, thin, you know, clerks, I want to say this, clerks in bookstores, in a sense, represent the wrath of God to many of us, that somehow the clerks in the bookstores uh, all seem to not only have assimilated all the knowledge in the bookstore, but somehow were responsible for its creation. And you get in there, and, and you, you're, you're afraid to ask for something. You, you, you come in, and, and here you are surrounded by Kierkegaard and Schopenhauer and Kafka and all the great writers of the past, and you go up to this guy and you say to him, <clears throat> you feel like you're, you're, you're bound, you're really duty-bound to ask him for something by, by, by Swift or Nietzsche or Ovid or someone like this. And you walk up to this guy and you say, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I, uh, <laughs> you have uh, anthologies here? And he says, why, yes, we have anthologies, the great short stories of the 18th century Italian Renaissance uh, uh, literary movement. We have uh, a great uh, collection of anthologies of uh, neo-Bachian romanticists. We have, uh, and you say, <clears throat> well, yes, i uh, tell you, I heard about this uh, this." Uh, <clears throat> This anthology of the best of Captain Billy's whiz bang. <laughs> You're embarrassed to ask, and the guy winks slowly with his left eye and says, "I know what you mean, Jack." And he reaches down under, and by the way, that wouldn't be a bad anthology, would it? The best of Captain Billy's whiz bang. Some of my more desperate moments when I was a kid was the fear that my mother would discover my cache of spicy detectives. A collection of spicy detectives wrapped in baseball uniforms, fielders' mitts, and, and, and catcher's gloves for years. Oh, I'll never forget the time. I'll never forget the, one of the worst moments that ever happened to me in my life is that I came into the sun porch. We had a sun parlor, parlor porch kind of thing, you know, where the, where the ferns were growing and there was a day bed. And my mother said... One day I came home from playing ball or something, and my mother said, uh, I think your father wants to see you. This is a bad thing right away. So he says, oh, 
Okay. And I figured he was going to make me wash the car or clean the fish or some ridiculous thing. And she says, he's in the sun porch. And so I go in the sun porch, and there is my old man sitting in an easy chair reading the latest copy of Spicy Detective, which I had stolen from George's newsstand not more than three hours before. It was still warm. And he's sitting there reading it. Oh, boy. And I walk in, and I said, <clears throat> Hi, Dad. And he said, uh, Hi. And I'm standing there shifting from one foot to the other, and he says to me, uh, You ever do any reading? And I say, yeah, <laughs> I like to read. Yeah, he uh, says, well, uh, what do you like to read? And I shift from one foot to the other. And I say, well, uh, Wizard of Oz. I like the Oz. And, and Raggedy Ann, Raggedy Andy. He said, did you read uh, the story here about this this uh, this detective who uh, gets this case in this small town? And there was this blonde who... <laughs> And my eyes are bulging, and, and he says, uh, go on back out and play baseball, son. Don't bother me. I'm reading. <laughs> I skulk past the ice box, out over the back porch, carrying my tape, ba and back out into the vacant lot, and never said a word. And, and, and as a matter of fact, I had one of the worst days in the field I've ever had in my life. A very bad situation. Speaking of situations, if you're looking for a restaurant that makes it, I would like to uh, highly recommend Ying and Yang. And I think I'm going to go down tonight myself. And in fact, I'll, I'll make that a promise. I feel like pampering myself. You know, I get back from, I get back from Rome and every place, and uh, and I'm trying to get back into the swing of things, and it's it's really not good. You know, I, I, it's a difficult thing. One of the worst things about Going off into dream world is coming back into the world of the, of the two chewed gum, and the smoke, the smoke cigar butt. You know what I mean? Coming back into reality, it's like when you come back from a trip to Rome or someplace like that. It's exactly like walking out of a movie, in the middle of the afternoon. You know that awful feeling of suddenly the sun is that, and, and and even the real things seem unreal. Well, I, I'm going to pamper myself, and I will definitely be tonight. I'm, I'm going down to Ying and Yang, and I better get on the phone and call them and make up a reservation for me. And I'm going to have chicken wings, and I'm just going to sit there. And I'm going to have chicken wings, and I'm just going to sit there and, and mull it over for a while. Now, here's where Ying and Yang is. It is one of the best restaurants I've ever discovered in this town. And I think you'll find that comes up because I, I'm continually getting letters from people about it. That it, it really does make it. Uh, it's a restaurant on 3rd Street in the village. And I, I might say that there's only two doors from one of the paper book gallery stores. There are two of them, one on 3rd and the other over on Sheridan Square, where 10th Street hits 7th Avenue South. Now, Ying and Yang is at 82 West 3rd Street. And uh, they're open until about 1 o'clock in the morning on Saturdays, and they're open till, I think, midnight on Sundays. And they open at noon, they have a bar, and they serve some of the most magnificent Chinese food concocted in the United States today. It is really a good restaurant. I'd like to, t I'd like to point out this to you. Uh, they only have 18 tables. And if you want to, want to get there, it would be very, if you want to have dinner there, it would be a very wise thing for you to do to call and make a reservation before you go down. It's Ying and Yang. Y-I-N-G and Y-A-N-G. 82 West 3rd Street in the village. And they're open all throughout the week. And I think I'll go down there and just pamper myself for a while. Have the guy, you know. But but this, this it's, it's like that sad little story. I saw a little story. I don't know whether you saw it. Again, it has to do with that stone idol. It has to do with a little round man standing in the batting cage at Coney Island swinging at fastballs thrown by a machine, Christa Matheson, whipping them past with fantastic blazing steam. There was a little note. Listen to this. It came from Upton, Massachusetts. Did you hear this? I wish I had mood music to play behind it. I don't need it because it has its own mood. Every man, believe me, I don't care who he is, every man lives surrounded by whatever dream or nightmare that is his own particular dream or nightmare. 
in this, and no one man can cross another's. No one man can ever quite penetrate another's. And, and for, this, for this reason and because of this, there have grown great fantastic mythologies. Get too close to that sun, buddy, and you're, gonna, you're just going to bake those... You're just going to bake those wax wings right off your back. Listen to this. Up to Massachusetts, today mourned the death of a little old lady who kept the spirit of July 4th alive when the town wanted it to die. Mrs. Emma J. Eames, a widow, died last night in a hospital after a short illness at the A4. Mrs. Eames lived alone in a tiny house by the town common in the central Massachusetts community of about 1,200 people. Each year she would watch the traditional parade or fireworks display when July 4th rolled around. But one year she was disappointed. Upton had decided to dispense with the celebration. Lack of interest, the town select men said, quote, the young fellows don't like to march, the veterans' organizations reported. Mrs. Eames was indignant. She decided to do something about it. So the next year, on July 4th, she arose early in the morning and donned her red, white, and blue polka dot dress. She took down from the attic a little tin horn that she had played when she was a child. And then she left her little house and began to march around the common all by herself, blowing the little tin horn on July 4th in Massachusetts. A policeman happened by and asked her what she was doing. Celebrating the 4th. She replied, he stayed to watch, and so did other passers-by. When she had circled the half-acre common a few more times, she abruptly turned her back on the spectators and without a word went back into her house. She did this for more than five years, and each year she attracted a larger crowd. Her march around the common became something of a tradition in the town of Upton, Massachusetts. Last year, Mrs. Eames was named Honorary Chairman of the town's 225th Anniversary Observation. A full-scale celebration with fireworks, parade, and a fireman's muster was planned to cover July 2nd through July 4th. But all she said to it was this, I'll still get out my little horn and celebrate in my own way. People today don't really know how to celebrate anymore. The greatest words I have heard in this century. People today do not know how to celebrate anymore. Mrs. Eames, by George, you said it for all of us. People today don't know how to celebrate anymore. Gene Shepard.